Now, welcome to another in our series about revival. Uh, today, my topic is city transformation. City transformation. And um, as it is with a, a lot of uh, this, exploring this theme of revival, one of the helpful things is actually looking at just real life accounts. Uh, because it's a concept that it's, it's difficult to summarize in a, a, a single sentence or two, what is revival? You get a picture as you hear the various stories. And so I'd like to share with you a story about a revival that took place in the uh, 90s, the mid-90s, in uh, Cali, Colombia. Now, if you're wondering about these stories, by the way, in the uh, revival book that is available, they're still available there on the, the information table at the back of the auditorium. Uh, if you're wondering about the stories, uh, many of the stories we're using are in there. In fact, every chapter opens with a story. And then there are sometimes other stories later on. Uh, so they are readily available. Though Ashley Rada was just telling me that in her Bible study group, um, they've been really thoroughly enjoying the scriptures and the stories and how God has been speaking to them as a small group Bible study. Now friends, um, let me start then with the story about Carly Columbia. Let's have a look at the pick of, a, pick of the place. There it is, about 2.5 million these days. Now, um, Carly Columbia, back in the 80s and uh, early 90s, it was most known for the drug lords of that city. Um, they had enormous power. Um, to just quote a few uh, uh, statistics here, the drug cartel had a financial turnover in the early 90s of 500 million per month. That's 6 billion a year. Um, they transported over 100 tonnes of cocaine to the USA and Europe annually. The USA Drug Enforcement Agency called the Carly Cartel the largest, richest and best managed criminal organisation in history. And, uh, you know, it, it meant with such enormous finance behind them, they controlled everything. The police force, the government, the media, you name it. Pastors included. Because, you see, when people spoke out against them, well, they would not only threaten them, but so often a family member or the person themselves would be promptly killed. It pervaded everything in the city. To... Um, to give you some idea of, of how the community was affected, according to the Transformations documentary, there are murders upward of 15 a day. Now you think about that for a moment. Here's our city of Melbourne, bigger than Carly. Imagine 15 murders as was quite normal in a single day. Well, this is the sort of environment that um, people found themselves in, and of course, uh, you, 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 you would wonder what it would be like to live in a place like that, wouldn't you? Uh, one of the reports I saw about it was um, it's not just people associated with the, the drugs and so forth that would kill, were killed. Often innocent bystanders were shot simply because they got in the fray of bullets. Well, um, you can imagine how the church has felt. Perhaps a little powerless, overwhelmed. What can we do against such opposition? But uh, a number of pastors in the early 90s got together and they started to say, well, how can we make a difference? We know we serve the King of Kings, the Almighty God. We know he's more powerful than anyone, anything. What can we do? And so they gathered for prayer and they thought they needed to try and understand what was going on, not just in the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm. And so they started to do something that is sometimes referred to as spiritual mapping, uh, a church growth uh, expert, uh, Peter Wagner, uh, he did a lot of lecturing in the 80s and 90s. I've listened to him many times. Uh, he talks a lot about this concept and how sometimes it can be strategic in seeing a city come to faith in Christ. Well, these guys, simply what they did was they, they did demographic research, psychographic research, and prayed into all of this to try and get an understanding of what really is going on in the supernatural realm. Well, in the journey of all of this, they picked up on a few things. Now, the first one is obvious. They realise there is some sort of spirit of violence over the city. It's not just the drug people, there's violence in the home, there's just violence everywhere. And they say they started to make a stand against this spirit of violence. The next thing that they felt was that there was a spirit of fear over the city. That's just one of the ones mentioned in the New Testament, a spirit of fear. They, they believe that there is a pervading fear. Now, you can see how that would be the case. 
I mean, people were in fear of their lives, I'm sure with the amount of control that these drug lords exercised, but they believed that this was not just a practical reality, it was something that was spiritual as well. And so they, they looked at this. The third thing, which is an interesting one, and which wouldn't have been so obvious, and they were surprised by this, but the amount of witchcraft in the city was overwhelming. In fact, even the macho drug lords would not make any major financial decision without first consulting with their medium. And so witchcraft pervaded the city as well. Well, in the journey of um, trying to deal with it, they started to pray specifically against those areas. Demonic powers of violence, demonic powers of fear, demonic powers of witchcraft. And uh, so initially it was church leaders and then they formed a meeting for thousands of people to come together for prayer. And they gathered in a, a large venue, they prayed, they worshipped, there was testimonies. Um, and in the journey of all of this, they believed, they sensed there was some sort of breakthrough in the heavenly realm. Now, you can, if there really is a breakthrough in the heavenly realm, you can measure it. You can, there's evidence in the practical realm. Well, the weekend following that prayer vigil, there was a headline in the newspapers in Cali, and it said, no murders. They'd gone an entire weekend without a murder. Normally, there'd be about 30. No murders. They knew they had affected the spiritual realm, which affected what was going on in their city. Well, encouraged by this, they thought they'd go all out and organise a huge meeting. And so they decided they would hire the soccer stadium. We're talking 55,000 seats. There was a lot of anxiety. How many people are going to come? Is it going to look really empty? But they got word out, they promoted it well, and people came in their thousands. In fact, they not only filled it, thousands who couldn't get in formed a prayer circle and just walked around the outside of the soccer stadium praying. What do they do? Same sort of thing. They worshipped God. The, the, the mayor, the Lord Mayor, opened it. He was a Christian. He prayed. And uh, people testified. People prayed. People worshipped God. And they proclaimed God's righteousness over the city. Well, they started to do these prayer vigils every month. And to give you something of the idea of the impact of this, the drug lords who they thought were completely untouchable first one was imprisoned and then another and then another six of the seven drug lords and associated criminals were imprisoned over the next nine months the power of the drug lords was broken untouchable certainly from a human point of view but not untouchable with the power of God acting through prayer what was the added transformation well, um, government cor corruption was greatly reduced, violence was greatly reduced, and to quote a different source, Operation World, it states that murder, kidnapping, crime rates show significant decreases. The city was changed. Perfect? Of course not. But greatly changed to where it was. Massive church growth took place. People coming to faith in Christ in their thousands. Um, most churches started to grow. Um, some saw extraordinary growth. One church which uh, was, uh, started to have to hold seven services a day, st despite having a very large auditorium, um, seven services from seven in the morning till um, the last one started at seven at night, finishing at, at nine at night. And um, uh, the, the attendance is some 35,000 people. God moved. Tremendous power. And it's one of the many recent examples of a genuine revival in a city. And you could say one of the most unlikely places, probably one of the darkest cities on the planet, and yet God showed up and turned things around. But prayer and unity were key in this journey. It tells us in Ephesians 6.10, Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Uh, the, the word schemes from the Greek is based on our word strategies. You could, you could be translated the devil's strategies. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
Now, when we're reading those things like powers and authorities, you might be thinking, well, what is that really referring to? Well, it clarifies it at the end, doesn't it? Spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, is this some sort of organized hierarchy? What is this? What is this a demonic, the description of these demonic powers? Well, conservative theologian John Stott, he's not a Pentecostal, and yet the late John Stott writes this about the passage. I'll put this up on the screen too. He states about that very, very cluster of verses, I have thus far assumed that by principalities and powers, Paul was alluding to personal demonic intelligences. Paul meant supernatural cosmic forces, a vast hierarchy of angelic and demonic beings. Stott makes it clear. This is a reality. This is a spiritual reality that every church is actually facing. And some may be under significant attack. It may well be this church is under significant attack. Certainly according to the organization I met with, it is. Can I suggest, first of all, First point today, to experience city transformation, number one, understand the primary battle is against the demonic. To experience city transformation, understand the primary battle is against the demonic. Next passage here is 2 Corinthians 10, 3. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Notice that, wage war as the world does. We don't fight war with guns and bombs it's suggesting but we do have a fight it's a spiritual war the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world on the contrary they have divine power to demolish strongholds we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ now so sort of scriptures it clearly mentions forms of warfare doesn't it that's where we get this idea of spiritual warfare from, these types of scriptures. Can I suggest this as a second point? Number two, to experience city transformation, the Christian must engage in spiritual warfare. To experience city transformation, the Christian must engage in spiritual warfare. And this is something that might be not really on your radar. It might even be a new con concept even for some. But my suggestion is, this is a real battle, and the more the saints, the people of God, that can be equipped to fight this battle, the more likely victory will come. You realize when it comes to um, the revival in Kali, it only happened when people came in significant numbers for prayer. It wasn't enough to have a handful. Significant numbers were important. Let me give an example of this, of when I lived in the Hills District of Sydney. I remember in... Um, year 99, uh, 88, uh, 98, 99, the Mardi Gras of Sydney was starting to be promoted more and more like a family event. Uh, and so, you know, I bring the kids, it's great fun, you know, that sort of thing. And of course, as, as most of you are aware, this is not a family event. I mean, a lot of it's R-rated. Let's look at one of the classic kind of images. Um, you know, it's, it's people you know, dressed like that all over the place. And there's all sorts of behaviour going on, which is certainly not family orientated at all. And so many of the Christian churches in the Hills District felt this is something we need to be praying about. You know, um, this, this Mardi Gras promotes sexual prom promiscuous sort of behaviour, debauchery, gay and lesbian relationships, stuff that we know that Jesus actually said, hey, this is not how I want you to live your life. And so we decided we would form a prayer meeting on Friday night before the the Mardi Gras, Thursday, Friday night before the Mardi Gras. And um, we gathered in one of the venues of the Hills District, fairly big venue, about 1,500 seats. Um, about 200 pastors were present and um, lots of different churches represented. We worshipped God for a time. Then uh, the pastors all came down on the stage, similar size stage to this, kind of packed it out, and we proclaimed a heap of prayers over the city. Uh, quoting scriptures like this, Psalm 89.2, I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Or 96.3, declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. Or Psalm 51.15, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. We, we've declared righteousness over the city. Um, well, we did the prayer meeting and it was the year 2000. That time and uh, the interesting thing was because the Mardi Gras had been growing rapidly at this point 
it did not grow that year. Well, we held the prayer vigil again. Same sort of thing the next year. This time, the Mardi Gras dropped in numbers significantly. We did it again the third year. And on the third year, you can find this from Google, in the 2002 Mardi Gras, it saw a financial loss of 400000 In August, the organising company was bankrupt. It was significantly scaled down over the next few years. Now, I moved uh, to Melbourne after that in 2003 and started working with Crossway, so I kind of lost touch with the prayer meeting. I think it did continue for another two or three years, but then they stopped it. And when they stopped it, the Mardi Gras just grew in numbers again and took off again. Now, I'm suggesting that when people come together in those sorts of numbers, especially cross-denominationally, it has far more impact than what we realise. The power of prayer with that sort of unity is an extraordinary thing. You might ask the question, well, Lee, how do I engage in spiritual warfare? Well, actually, chapter 6 of Ephesians, and I'm sure Josh will explain this further in his series, but let me just mention um, one of the key verses. Ephesians 6, 17 and 18. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Two keys there. The sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Powerfully wielding the Word of God. And secondly, pray in the Spirit. You know, pray led of the Holy Spirit on all occasions. Can I suggest this? Number three, to experience city transformation, the weapons we use include God's word and prayer. To experience city transformation, the weapons we use include God's word and prayer. What happens when we pray? What happens in the spiritual realm when we pray? We know though the Lord's given us some interesting insights throughout Scripture. Let me refer to Daniel for a moment, the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10, starting at verse 1. It says this, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, we were talking a lot about the Persians in the Nehemiah series, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. Verse 2, at that time I, Daniel, he writes, mourned for three weeks. I ate no food, no meat, no wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all till the three weeks were over. So he has a time of prayer and fasting. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris. I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of gold from Euphaz around his waist, His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of the multitude. So here's an angel, an angel of God that appears before Daniel. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale. I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking. And as I listened to him, I fell into a sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up, trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day, now notice that, since the first day, when he first started praying and fasting, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Many commentators would say that was referring to a powerful demonic force over Persia. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, Michael the archangel, came to me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. 
You got the idea? Daniel prays and fasts. God sends an angel in answer to his prayer, but the angel is hindered. It is not able to communicate with Daniel because it's resisted by a powerful Persian demonic force. When I say Persian, over having jurisdiction over Persia. And it's, not, it's, it's more than 21 days till finally Daniel, the angel communicates with Daniel. Do you find this fascinating? We have these, these insights. Um, and only when Michael, another angel, is sent to see it, realise is the battle won. Now, I want to make the suggestion that this sort of battle is going on all the time. I know we're probably oblivious to most of it. But it's far more real than I think any of us have really comprehended. You see, God answers prayers in three primary ways. We're very comfortable and familiar with he answers prayers through humans. We pray for something and someone's prompted and that prayer is answered through a person. We're kind of used to God answers prayers through his Holy Spirit. God himself steps in and sees it done. But in Scripture, we also see plenty of examples of how God actually answers prayers through angels. Now you might say, well, what, what, what do you mean though, Lee? You know, do you mean that if I pray, an angel like a servant is going to come and help me see that prayer realised? Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Let me look at the book of Hebrews for a moment. It says in Hebrews 1.14, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Angels are considered servants. To who? To those who inherit salvation. Who are they? Genuine believers in Jesus. That's you and I, friends. That's one of the ways that God operates. Let me try and bring this to life a little bit with another story. Uh, some, quite, a, quite a few years ago when I was a young adult living in Launceston, Tasmania, I, um, I remember we were with a bunch of people that were quite into prayer and uh, there was an event going to be held at the, the basin, which is a big kind of, um, there's a, a river flows through into what was probably an extinct volcano, forms a huge pool of water, beautiful area, and green lawns and um, forests and so forth around it. Often big events take place there in Launceston. Well, there was to be a spiritualist event. Uh, it was actually advertised as a cultural event. But when you read about all the idols and so forth that was going to be brought in, we saw it as much more of a spiritualist event. We saw it as a bad thing for the city, and uh, we felt we should pray against it. So uh, quite a number of Christians got together. We, we prayed against this event taking place, and our, one of our big themes in the prayer meeting was, Lord, rain it out, because it's an open-door venue. So, uh, you know, so God, send the rain, because you know, we knew if it rained, not many people would come. Um, anyway, uh, we thought we'd had a breakthrough, and... Um, so, you know, um, clouds the next day, the Saturday. We were praying on the Friday. We thought, okay, that's looking good. But the event took place and it didn't actually rain. And it was pretty well attended. We still went along. We handed out some Christian literature and had some good spiritual conversations with people. But we felt really, to be honest, quite defeated. And it didn't make sense to us because we felt the Lord had heard and he was going to respond. I walked down in the basin area. Um, it was probably two, three days later. There'd been a torrential downfall. In fact, where the, the venue would be hosted, the swimming pool area and everything was underwater. The river had burst its banks, two or three metres of water where people would have been standing. And I thought, what's going on here? That's what we were praying for. <laughs> but it's like two or three days later. And I felt the Lord pointed me to this very passage. That God sent an angel immediately as we were praying, but with all of the demonic activity that this spiritualist event was conjuring, the angel was hindered, and unfortunately the storm didn't come until the event was by then over. Can I suggest this? Number four, to experience city transformation, gain insight into the spiritual realm. We've got to get better at this. To experience city transformation, gain insight into the spiritual realm. Now, it's interesting, actually, speaking of the prince of the power of Persia, it's interesting how when Iranian people leave the country, how often it's as if the, the, the veil is lifted and they see Jesus suddenly not as just a prophet but actually as the Son of God. 
I remember some years ago, um, Danny Nong uh, had established a, a young, new Persian church. And uh, they were just running midweek services at that time. And I'd been invited along to speak a couple of times. And I, I remember going into the meeting, there were about 70 of them or so. Half of them were still Muslim. The other half were Persians who had recently come to Christ. And I've been asked actually to speak on spiritual uh, warfare of all things. I've been asked to speak about the demonic realm. And, um, and so I spoke on this and I, I remember chatting to a, uh, a young Muslim lady who had been in her late 20s, very smartly dressed, um, and uh, just a little bit. And she, says, she just said to me, look, I'm a Muslim, but I'm kind of exploring what this Christianity is about. Back in, um, she'd never really thought about it when she was in her own country. She comes over here and it's as if the, vi- the, the veil is lifted and suddenly she's open, she's interested, as many others were there. Well, I preached this message on uh, the demonic realm and then gave a call for people who wanted to become Christians. Uh, A number came forward, but seven of them came forward and accepted Jesus. These are Muslim people, accepted Jesus as Lord and Saviour. This lady was one of them. And she said to me afterwards, she said, when the worship started, I I began shaking uncontrollably. And then, then there was the announcements and so forth. And then you preached and then I started shaking again uncontrollably. And I sensed that this Jesus being the Son of God, this Jesus, why is this happening if Jesus isn't real? Why am I so affected by this? And she gave a life to Christ, as did a number of others with similar experiences. But the interesting thing is when you talked with some of them in their own country, many of them had not really honestly considered Christ at all. They came here, the veil was lifted, they got out from under, the, the, as um, it's referred to in the passage, the prince of the Persian kingdom. And they could see Jesus as he truly was. Now, God, his God is not limited by demonic powers, but it all plays a part. How can we have any authority over demons, though? You and I. I'm sure sometimes, like myself, we probably feel you know, a bit puny, a bit weak before this concept of dealing with the demonic power. Well, we can have authority because of what it says in Colossians. Look at 2.13, second part of the verse. It says, he forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the powers and authorities. That's that same phrase, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross because of jesus work on the cross as it's worded there the powers and authorities that we learn from ephesians is referring to spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms because of jesus work on the cross we can have victory that's where our authority lies because of jesus work and of course we see much of this actualized in the new testament but instead of, um, you know, perhaps quoting from the, the great uh, Apostle Peter or Paul, um, let me just pick someone who's not one of the 12 apostles or a chap called Philip. Now, remember in uh, the book of Acts, um, Philip and Stephen and a few others were chosen to deal with a very practical thing. The 12 apostles were leading the church, preaching, healing the sick, doing evangelism, making disciples and so forth. But they had a practical issue. Remember that? The, um, the Grecian ladies um, were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food so the hebraic uh, jews were getting the food but the the grecian ladies those who may have been believers in the one true god and even in even from a kind of that that heritage of the old testament nevertheless with the grecian background they were missing out so obviously a bit of racism going on there well um the apostles heard about this and they appointed seven guys to deal with it One of them was this chap called Philip. So he's just dealing with this practical pastoral issue initially. But ultimately becomes this great evangelist. Now look how he operates as he comes cross-culturally into the city of Samaria. Acts uh, Acts, um, 8, 5 rather. 8, 5 of Acts. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shriek, impure spirits came out of many who were paralyzed or lame and those who were paralyzed or lame were healed so here philip 
as, as a church is established in Samaria, one of the first things he does, he deals with demonic powers. Miracles take place, people are healed, people are saved, and a church is established. But isn't it interesting? One of the first things he did, he dealt with the demonic realm around that city. Can I suggest this? To experience city transformation, recognize that Christians have authority over spiritual powers. To experience city transformation, recognize that Christians have authority over evil spiritual powers. Now I can guarantee there'll be some spiritual strongholds over this shire of Manningham or the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. There'll be specific areas that they operate in, whether they are areas to blind people or control people. One of the areas that I think is uh, apparent in this area is actually materialism. So many people will put so much confidence in if I just have that, you know, successful career, I've got lots of income, I can buy the large home, I can buy the new car, I can have uh, comfortable, luxurious furniture in my house, I can go on, you know, quality holidays, that's all I need, that's life, I've got it all together, you know, I, I don't need God. And so with that deception, the materialistic deception, of course, people are blinded to the need for Jesus. And even Christians can get caught up in this. Nothing wrong with those things necessarily, but they can dominate the person's life to where they're blinded to their need for more important issues such as spiritual matters. Another real area, I believe, in this region is the area of, dep of despair or depression. Some might call it a spirit of death. It's very prevalent amongst young adults, but it's beyond that. And where people are feeling that life is so dark and so difficult that they want to chase after forms of escapism, such as hard drugs. And of course, we had you know, a very sad funeral here recently where a lovely young adult man, I'd met with him several times and he talked at length with me about some of the despair, some of the struggles that he had, finally came to Christ right at the end, but he'd taken a drug overdose because substance abuse had been a part of his life because of the need to escape, because of the despair, because of the pain, because of, we might even say, a spirit of death attacking him. Now, this is a reality that many young people, but it's beyond young people, it's right through the generations. This is a reality in this city as well, something we need to pray against, right here in the Manningham Shire. Let me suggest a third area. I mentioned earlier in the service that I went to uh, Oz Challenge Incorporated and um, they did some prayer and some thought and some analysis of this area and uh, one of the things that they came up with is they believe that um, there are three witches' covens in this area and that they pray specifically against this church, they curse this church, they are positioned in almost like a, a triangle around this church and that they've been attacking us through curses and prayers for years. And we're not the only church, of course. And one of our sister Baptist churches recently found occultic paraphernalia on their property where it was clear that some incantation or curse had been placed right there on their church. This is real, friends. This is stuff that we're having to face and deal with. It's stuff that we generally don't think much about. But I think it's something we do need more education on and I think it's something we do need to resist. We're in a spiritual war. Can I remind you what it says in 2 Corinthians 10.4? The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Those things I mentioned could be considered strongholds, materialism, despair, depression, and witchcraft. Three areas. Through our prayers, through our spoken words, quoting the scriptures, we have authority to demolish strongholds. You know, one of my favorite spiritual warfare verses is Philippians 2.9. Let me read it. Some of you will have memorized this. Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a scripture that emphasizes that Jesus ultimately is all, Lord of all. 
Ultimately, in Jesus' second coming, all will bow the knee to Jesus. Already, the angels of heaven completely submit to him. There are some on earth that submit to him. About 30% of the world's population claim to be Christian, but probably about half of them are the real deal. They're genuine followers of Jesus. But the day will come when every human will have to acknowledge Jesus as Lord, willingly or unwillingly. But it also says, it mentions those under the earth, which is simply a way of describing another realm, that there is the realm of the demonic powers, but ultimately they must bow the knee as well. But Jesus is Lord of all lords. He is the mighty king of all kings. It's always good to have that in our mind when we pray. We need to have real faith that Jesus is the victor. He is the Lord of all lords. And therefore, what can we do to experience more of that victory in our own lives? Well, as part of the Bible reading today, the continued passage in Ephesians mentions what is often referred to as the armour of God. Let's look at these six areas right now. Six things that we can do. It mentions the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirits. Now, these are things you can actually pray over your life for protection. And let me suggest to make it easier for you, I've actually popped out one of these brochures here. This is in your handout today. This will give you the tools of actually being able to pray that over your life. You know, I've, I've been praying it a lot over my life just of late. I know I've met some Christians who pray it over their life every day and they have for years. But let me suggest this is something that's worth using in your personal quiet times to protect you from demonic attack and deception. It tells us in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Oh, friends, may we have faith. Can I suggest this? Finally, to experience city transformation, believe Jesus is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. To experience city transformation, believe Jesus is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. May our faith be vibrant and alive, expectant of that mighty power of God operating through us to see extraordinary things happen. Well, just to recap today, six principles we've learned. To experience city transformation, one, understand the primary battle is against the demonic. Two, the Christian must engage in spiritual warfare. Three, the weapons we use include God's word and prayer. Four, gain insight into the spiritual realm. Five, recognize that Christians have authority over evil spiritual powers. Six, believe Jesus is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Would you be upstanding as the worship team returns and we pray together? Father, here this very day, the scriptures have reminded us that there is a spiritual battle going on, perhaps for far more real and intense than what we have fully comprehended. And Father, here today, one of the things that we want to do is we do want to pray against some of the strongholds over this very area in the Manningham Shire. We stand against the, the spirit behind materialism, where people are blinded to the reality of you and get so caught up in just making life comfortable that there's no real room for you. Father, create a need in people to see how Jesus is actually the source of life. Father, secondly, we think of those who are suffering the real despair or depression or some might say a spirit of death. We command any demonic powers of death away from our Manningham Shire in Jesus' name. And rather we pray for for many people who suffer that deep depression, that, that journey into escapism with, with all manner of hard drugs, we want to pray for their protection, Lord, and we want to stand against the spirit of death that influences their lives in Jesus' name. And Father, finally, we also stand against the spirit of witchcraft. Those who are involved in Satanism or the occult or those who are witches, Father, I'm increasingly aware that there's much more of that activity in this area than perhaps what I realised. 
Father, I want to stand against it this very day. I stand against the spirit of witchcraft, the demonic powers that drive this. And in Jesus' name, we break it, asking that Jesus be glorified, that he would bring victory and his kingdom will be firmly established in this place. We stand against those very strongholds within this church. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would reign supreme as Lord of all lords and King of all kings and that your name might be glorified. Amen.